Roller. Welcome to our podcast. Welcome. Maybe welcome back? Hopefully welcome back. Yes, please. <laughs> Hopefully welcome back. But, um, no, you guys have no idea the process, man, we have to go through before we are able to record. We got, like, four cats running around behind us at all times, mm -hmm. and, like, we're just about to record, and then one cat has to eat, and then we stop recording for a second, or, like, you know, we just wait a minute, and then all of a sudden the cats are chasing each other, and then one's meowing. So we literally revolve our whole, like, first few minutes around getting them <laughs> to calm down. Mm -hmm. It's a bad, oh, one's back. That's little Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> he just gotta say hi. Um, hopefully, you guys are all sort of entertained during quarantine. I know I'm definitely not. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, bored out of my mind basically every day. I actually picked up hours at work. I literally went into work just because I was that bored. Like, <laughs> that's the point it's gotten to. I just think that's so interesting because I've seriously never been more busy in my entire life you know, than right now. I don't know right what now. is wrong with you. You just, yeah, you <laughs> find stuff to do constantly and I'm just, like, going stir crazy. But yeah. on the other hand, you're not a very big people person and I am. I mean, I like to go out to bands and all that stuff, but yeah, I don't need people. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't need people. No, you're just not a huge people person. You know, I'm like a social freaking butterfly. Yeah. And you're just... You're you. <laughs> I mean, I sure am. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, no, uh, me and my mom were actually uh, talking earlier about, like, you know, how some people are wearing masks and whatnot out, and she was like, you know, I don't even care anymore. I'm going to look like that crazy person, and she's like, you shouldn't care either, and I just, like, pause, and I look at her, and I'm like, mom, like, <laughs> you're talking to your daughter who wears onesies out in public? <laughs> Like, to the bar. She would go in it's a onesie. True. I really did. And then she's like, oh, I need groceries. There she goes, in a onesie. <laughs> I've got a whole collection of them. I'm not even going to deny it. Mm -hmm. I've probably got, like, 15 or 20, 20 onesies. That almost came out twinsies. <laughs> <laughs> she's got the twinsies. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and she's right. I did go to a bar in a onesie multiple times, but... Yeah. Um, there was this one time that, you know, we were in Wisconsin for, um, you know, my boyfriend, he sings in a band and they were playing there that night and <laughs> I had realized once I got in the bar and was dancing that I accidentally wore my slippers in and then I did not have my shoes with me at all. I straight up wore my slippers to the bar. <laughs> so I looked down, I realized it. I'm just like, you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the car. I went back to his car. I ripped off all my clothes, threw on a onesie, and walked in the bar, and my onesie and my slippers, yeah. and I danced with people all night long, and it was a great time. Super hot, though. Oh, my God. I was dying of heat. Oh, I bet. But after that, I was actually able to convince the entire band to wear onesies, and we kind of did, like, a... Like a almost like a, a flash mob in Anoka of everybody dressed in onesies, but nobody knew about it except for, like, my friends in the band. So we just, like, all showed up and took over the entire bar in onesies. <laughs> and it was awesome. And I had this basket of onesies in my trunk. And, like, the band members were literally just, like, picking onesies out of there and putting them on. And, like, half the people in the bar are wearing my onesies. <laughs> but we had a great night. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and they was just saying, I'm just like, Mom, you're like, I'm the last person you need to worry about, like, thinking about what other people think because, you know. She just goes for it. I just don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah. God gave me a warning label and made me a redhead for a reason, and that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> for real. No, it's a warning label. She's right. <laughs> But since I know we're bored and haven't got to go out, do you got anything interesting you can share? I'm not bored. Here's well, the thing. I'm bored. <laughs> I have, uh, I mean, just been 
doing all the podcast things, uh, researching, putting together the stories, trying to figure out how to edit. And I finished a 21 day workout program. So kind of proud of myself for that one. It was really fun because I came down the stairs and she was working out <laughs> and she would be standing up straight and then she would have to go down to the ground for a second and I'd just see her petting her cat and then standing back up and then bending down, petting her cat and standing back up. But he just sat there and took it. He was just like, that's right. Love me. Yeah. Gypsy shows up every time I do a workout. And so like when I do squats, uh, I, every time I squat, I have to pet his head. And then he's got her trained. Yeah. When I do planks, he rolls underneath me, which is very interesting. And when I do push ups, I have to kiss him every time. And if she's on her back, like I'll I'll come down and he'll be on his back too. Yeah. <laughs> so we work out together. And that makes it a lot better. I love it. Also, another thing I've been doing during quarantine is watching a lot of the online concerts. And let me tell you what. Okay, so Thunderstruck is one of my top favorite bands. They're an ACDC cover band, and they totally killed it. Recently, they did um, a concert. I think it was like an hour long. It was fantastic. Also, I saw one from like Junk FM. They did great. So I've been keeping busy with that. Yes, but I definitely walked in the house in the middle of them <gasps> jamming to like the Thunderstruck one. Me and my mom were dancing in the living room. Literally. <laughs> like I walk in the door and all I see is these two dancing their asses off and the TV turned up like blasted. All the cats are freaking out. Mm -hmm. And they're just having the time of their damn lives in the living room. We were. It was so much fun. <laughs> Uh, and then I, of course, like I said last time, uh, am watching a lot of the cat TV. So, um, I turned it on the other day. It had squirrels and F Frankie, like a spider monkey, jumped from the floor all the way up to the TV that's on the wall, slams into it and falls behind a dresser. <laughs> and so I like jump up, I go running over and I peek back and we're both just staring at each other and I'm not really sure what to do so that I can like get him out of there and not have him freak out. Um, but that was a fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Also, guess what? Oh, geez. I had another dream. Oh, that's really what I wanted to hear. You were in it. Yay. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't you just love that? She has terrible dreams. I mean, we both have really disgusting dreams, but, like, I got woken up. Like, I literally woke up, and I roll over, and I read the message from her about this dream. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, it was a terrible thing to wake up to. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I just figured that she'd want to know right away. I didn't. Um, so I, of course, was being a good sister and sent it to her. I didn't want to know. Uh, but I'll provide more details for you You don't now. want to know either. So here we go. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so Hannah and I, in this dream... God, of course it has to include me. We're on a trip. We were on vacation. On a little rocket ship. <laughs> Throwing through <laughs> the sky. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, anyways. <laughs> uh, so we pulled over uh, to get something to eat. And then we were at like this shopping mall. So we go into this store where we uh, are looking at these little boxes that have like rings and necklaces, different jewelry in them. And her and I each pick one out. We Which get, is clearly, like, not us at all. Right. <laughs> um, we get up to the counter to pay, and all of a sudden, there is a huge fight that breaks out, and there's people getting stabbed everywhere, and it's, like, mass genocide situation. Bodies are just dropping, and so Hannah and I hop over the counter, and we're, like, hiding behind it. And as we peek up, we see this lady that, like, falls back into this armchair. And everything would have probably been fine for her because she wasn't wounded that badly. But 
the lady that was on the floor grabbed her leg and bit into her thigh and like tore it off with her teeth like she was eating a drumstick. And so this wound is wide open, gaping, and she bites it again and takes another one. Um, and then after everyone is like dead, then in my dream, it almost like fast forwards really fast. So you see everything like swirl around and then these guys come in there and they've got these big gray bins and they have to clean up the crime scene. And that was the end of my story with you. You've got really fucking bad dreams. That's disgusting. <sighs> See? Even Frankie, Frankie didn't said love that's it. nasty. Like some chick eating somebody else's leg like a fucking like... <laughs> exactly. He, he stole the words right out of my mouth. Um, okay, so maybe next time we won't tell dreams when Frankie's down here. No, because that was a terrible dream anyways. You try to give everybody else nightmares because you have nightmares, man. That's rude. <laughs> well. Now everybody's gonna be dreaming that people are like <laughs> biting into their thighs like a freaking drum bone or something. Like Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah, it was like just flesh hanging off. God, can you give me something better than that? Because, like, I'm not feeling it. I can, yes. Um, I actually have a story for you, and it's about poisonings. Does that work? I mean... It's not like you have a choice. <laughs> so... <laughs> biting in a leg... Biting in a legs, or... Mm -hmm. Poisoning... I guess I'm going to take the poisoning. Perfect. All right. Well, today's story is going to be for the state of Alabama. And we'll just kind of dive into a little bit of backstory. Uh, Huey Frazier and Lucille Meads married in January 1932. They both came from families whose lives were centered on the local mills. So they were accustomed to long hours of labor. Their daughter, Audrey Marie was born on June 4th, 1933, and relatives cared for her while her parents worked those long hours. Huey and Lucille spoiled Audrey out of guilt, and she learned how to get what she wanted by throwing a tantrum. But it always goes well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm guessing it did go well for her. Audrey began seventh Since grade. Since the sarcasm here, <laughs> Megan... <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but Audrey began seventh grade in a new school among children of privilege. She studied hard, joined student council, and earned a reputation for maturity and intelligence. See, it did go well. In high school, Audrey joined the Future Teachers of America and the Commercial Club, an organization for girls who planned secretarial careers. She was a very pretty girl and got lots of attention. When Audrey was 12, she met a boy named Frank Hilly. He didn't come from a family with money like her parents would have wanted, but he treated her like royalty. Frank went into the Navy after high school, and even though the young couple thought often, he was afraid of losing her. When Frank was assigned to Guam, they got married while he was on leave in May 1951 when Audrey was just 18 years old. Frank was sending checks home and Audrey spent them constantly on new clothes and furnishings. I wish somebody would send me checks. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was the main source of their fights. Oh. Stacks of bills were showing up to the home and eventually... Audrey began routing the bills to a post office box and taking out loans to hide it all. In May 1975, Frank visited his doctor, complaining of nausea and tenderness in his abdomen. He was diagnosed with a viral stomachache. The condition persisted, and he was admitted to the hospital for tests that indicated liver malfunction. Physicians then diagnosed infectious hepatitis. Frank died early in the morning, May 25th, 1975. He had a life insurance policy for $31,140. Today, 
it would be equivalent to $154,184.40. Ooh. Yes. Shit. It's a little bit of a hefty Ugh. policy. Uh, soon after Frank died, his mother, Lucille, was diagnosed with cancer, and Audrey was so sweet and began caring for her. Audrey asked her daughter, Carol, her son, Mike, and Terry to move in with her. They all accepted, but regretted that decision as soon as the demands for attention and constant fighting were just too much to bear. Terry was often ill with stomach troubles and had four miscarriages while living there. Wow. it's a lot. That is a lot. Mm-hmm. Mike and Terry found an apartment, but the night before they were set to move out, Audrey's house caught on fire. They mm. all moved back into the apartment while the home was being repaired. Oddly enough, when it was time to move back to the home, the apartment next door to Mike and Terry's caught on fire, and they were forced to move back into Audrey's home. Lucille Frazier died January of 1977. In the following months, the police department became very familiar with Audrey. She reported a series of petty thefts, gas leaks, and claims she found a small fire in her closet. Her and those fires. It's so weird. Like, <laughs> I see where she's coming from, like, what is, where she's trying to, like, kind of stay in, like, cahoots with them. Mm -hmm. But, like, on the other hand, I feel like you make yourself... You're, like... Putting a target exactly. on your back. Like, they know who you are now and what you're up to. That's exactly. Her neighbor, Doris Troy, found a similar fire in her own hall closet one night. Damn, none of the fires. <sighs> the two ladies also reported harassing phone calls. One officer, Billy Atherton, fell for her black widow charm and began a sexual relationship. Oh, no. Dad earmuffs. Many patrolmen, <laughs> she acts like anybody's going to listen, <laughs> were called to the home and would always be greeted with a fresh pot of coffee. At least two officers later complained of severe stomach cramps and nausea after drinking the coffee. There were also numerous unexplained illnesses of various neighborhood children who played at the home. Huh. One of Carol's playmates, 11-year-old, Sonia Gibson died of unknown causes. Man. I know. Leave the kids alone. Yes, leave those kids alone. Hey, teachers. Leave those kids alone. <laughs> <laughs> there was also a family that lived next to Audrey for years, and the children were sick all the time. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong, but the children quickly recovered once they moved. Three years after redeeming the life insurance policy for Frank, Audrey took out a $25,000 policy on her daughter, Carol, and that took effect August 1978. Within a few months, Carol began to experience trouble with nausea and was admitted to the emergency room several times. This is sounding familiar. <laughs> is it? A year after insuring her daughter, she began giving Carol injections to alleviate the nausea. The symptoms didn't disappear and eventually worsened. Carol also began experiencing numbness in her extremities and was admitted to the hospital for tests. Unable to diagnose any disease, Carol's physician brought in a psychiatrist. While she was undergoing psychiatric testing at Birmingham's Caraway Methodist Hospital, Carol received two more injections from her mom, who warned her that no one was to know about the shots. She explained the shots were given to her by a friend, who was a registered nurse. A month after Carol was admitted to the hospital, her physician said she was suffering from malnutrition and vitamin deficiencies. He also suspected heavy metal poisoning was to blame for her symptoms. Audrey had Carol discharged that afternoon and the next day, she was admitted to the University of Alabama Hospital in Birmingham. Coincidentally, Audrey was arrested this same day for writing bad checks. They were the checks written to the life insurance company that insured Carol's life, causing the policy to lapse. What the hell? I know. Carol 
had no idea that her mom was finally getting caught up with her web of lies and was dealing with all this check fraud. Meanwhile, Carol's brother, Mike, was slowly coming to the conclusion that maybe his father didn't die from natural causes. It's just so sad that, like, she's, you know, super sick and whatnot, and, like, he's starting to come to it, but she's not, and, like, she's getting injections, like... That's awful. Right. And, like, from somebody you trust because, you know, you trust your mom. Of course. Like, you're never going to expect that your mom's, like, poisoning or hurting you. This is awful. Yeah, she's there to help, right? One of Carol's friends from the church, Eve Cole, was able to really get the ball rolling with this investigation. She had been present at Carol's apartment one night when Audrey gave her an injection. During a phone call... Carol mentioned that she had received injections during her hospitalization. Eve was concerned and told Carol's aunt Frida, who turned around and called Carol's brother Mike. This was the ammunition he needed. Mike wrote a long letter to Ralph Phillips, the Calhoun County coroner. He recounted his father's rapid decline and death, Lucille Frazier's death, Audrey's banking troubles, and Carol's illness. The university hospital physicians concentrated their investigation on the possibility of heavy metal poisoning, noting that Carol's hands and feet were numb, she had nerve palsy causing foot drop, and she had lost most of her deep tendon reflexes. What the shit is foot drop? Um, I think your foot just drops. Just like it says. Right. What are you not getting? <laughs> I've just never heard of it. Um, okay. So it just drops? It just drops. Cool. You gotta catch it. I don't want foot drop. No. <laughs> like my feet where they are. Um, okay, well, then I shouldn't poison you. <laughs> Frank Hilly's body was exhumed for testing. The analysis revealed abnormally high levels of arsenic, ranging from 10 times the normal level in hair samples to 100 times the normal level in his toenail samples. Holy shit. I don't want to be the person taking toenail samples. (laughs) Just saying. (laughs) That doesn't sound fun. No, no, it doesn't. Um, But if you do that, that's really cool for you. (laughs) That's encouraging. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So his death was now ruled acute arsenic poisoning. It was noted that Frank suffered from chronic arsenic poisoning, meaning he had been given arsenic for months prior to his death. Three days after the uh, exhuming of the body and tests on Carol, Frank's sister found an empty medicine vial in a cosmetic case among Audrey's belongings. The vial was turned over to the police and revealed traces of arsenic. On October 25th, 1979, Audrey was indicted for attempted murder of her daughter, plus an unrelated charge of check fraud. Three weeks later, she was free on a $14,000 bond. She vanished from a Birmingham motel where she had been waiting trial, and she left a note saying, might have been kidnapped. (laughs) On November 19th, There was a break-in at the home of her aunt. A car, women's clothing, and an overnight bag were missing from the home. A note was found and said, Do not call the police. We will burn you out if you do. What the fuck does that mean? We found what we wanted and we will not bother you again. We will burn you out. I have no idea. (laughs) I feel like that's a stoner term. (laughs) I mean... That I should know. (laughs) That's how I read it. I will burn you out. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Indictments were handed down in the murder of her husband on January 11th, 1980. Audrey adopted the new identity of Robbie Hannon and found herself a nice man named John Holman in Marlowe, New Hampshire. They lived together for several months before getting married in May 1981. Robbie often spoke about her twin sister, Terry, who lived in Texas. A month after getting married, Robbie told her husband that she needed to attend to some family business and see some doctors about an illness. 
she traveled to Texas and Florida using the alias Terry Martin. Now, as Terry Martin, she calls John Homan and informs him that Robbie Homan died in Texas, but there's no need for him to come to Texas because the body was donated to medical science. Well, of course. Right? It makes perfect sense. So Terry changed her hair color and lost weight so that she could return to New Hampshire and meet John Homan, posing as Terry Martin, his deceased wife's sister. This is pretty sneaky. I'm not going to lie. It's twisted, man. Holy cow. <laughs> Uh, they began living together so Terry could spend time consoling John. An obituary for Robbie Holman appeared in a New Hampshire paper, and police grew suspicious. They brought Terry Martin in for questioning, and she ended up confessing to being Audrey and was returned to Alabama for her trial. She was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for her husband's murder and 20 years for attempting to kill her daughter. She began her sentence in 1983 and was a quiet model prisoner. <laughs> Literally, naturally, that's, I swear, like, some of the worst are, like, the most model prisoners. Yes, but, see, her good behavior earned her several one day passes from the prison, and she always arrived back on time. Oh, God. That makes it better. Yeah. In February 1987, she was given a three-day pass to oh, visit her nice. husband, John Holman, who moved to Anniston because he wanted to be near her. You're in prison, but you don't have three days. Go ahead. You need a little, you know, retreat. Go little, for little it. vacation. Absolutely. You earned it. From being a shitty person. Mm hmm so they spent a day at the motel, and when John left for a few hours... Did she leave him a note? <laughs> Wouldn't you like that? <laughs> I would, actually. She was, like, just waiting to yell that out. I was. Uh, she left a note. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> she was just asking for forgiveness. Her escape prompted an inquiry into the prison system's furlough policy. This time... Audrey wasn't missing for very long. Four days later, the Aniston police responded to a call about a suspicious person. Audrey had been crawling around the woods, drenched by four days of frequent rain and numb from temps dropping to the low 30s. What the fuck? Yeah, that she's just like crawling around out there. Central. I know. That is literally what my nightmares are made of. Straight out of there. Her body temp had fallen to 81 degrees, and she was taken to a local hospital and underwent emergency treatment for hypothermia. I'm still stuck on the crawling around the woods. Well, while she was at the <laughs> hospital, she suffered heart failure and died. Oh, well, I guess that solves my nightmare. <laughs> yeah, nightmare over. She died. She's not crawling around in your woods, or is she? Okay, let's not go there. <laughs> You don't want to leave it on that note? No, I really, really would rather we don't. Okay, so let's talk about a couple thoughts that I had. I'm intrigued. All right, with someone that plans everything out, she has all these things that she's doing behind the scenes, poisoning people, taking out insurance policies, yada yada. Do you think that maybe somebody was supposed to meet her that day? And then just didn't? Yeah, that would like make just sense. ditched her ass. Well, it is weird. And, like, listen, I get it if you get lost in the woods. But, like, you know, this sounds like woods, like, in town, not, like, you know, like the fucking rainforest or something. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And so, like, I can see where you, you can still get lost in that type of situation. But I feel like crawling around the woods for days in the rain, like, when you're that planned out of a person. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just seems odd to, like, go to the woods and have no plan, no way to get out, well, nowhere her, to go. With all her other planning, too. Yeah. Like, I just feel like there's no way that she would take that specific time. Mm -hmm. Because she had furlough. She was allowed to leave. I know. Isn't that crazy? So, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, she would have had to have planned almost specifically which one she was going to choose to yeah. take off on. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. That's weird. Yeah, it just seems like this one was out of character. That's really weird. Yeah, so... I don't know. That was my poisoning story for you. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good story. Yeah. I'm still looking at my fingernails. She is. She's a little paranoid right now. <laughs> I really am. I am. I'm looking, guys. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So you should subscribe to our podcast and listen to more because we have other things planned and coming up and I think it's going to be fun and you should also uh like us, us on Facebook. Facebook. Hey. Ah, did we say our you. names? Oh shit. I'm Megan. <laughs> oh, I'm Hannah. <laughs> we are clearly not off to a great start, but I swear it gets better from here, right? Um, sure. <laughs> All right, well, that's all we have for you today. Uh, Thanks for tuning in and drinking the Kool-Aid with us. Um, Bye! It's literally like somebody took a piece of Play-Doh and made a cat and then just put a tail on it crooked. Like, just slapped it on there. Aww. You're my Play-Doh cat. This was the ammunition. (laughs) (laughs) What? Son of a bitch. Homie, you've got to leave these in here.